watching and joining us tonight uh, on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Good evening or magandang gabi in Tagalog. Uh, welcome to our third night or third session of our week-long devotional, which is entitled as Heroes, Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. Um, if you weren't able to join us on the first two nights, don't worry, you can definitely catch up on um, and watch the videos on Fountain in the City's Facebook and YouTube page. And um, for tonight, we have a very, very special guest who is coming all the way from the Philippines. And just like everyone else who is here tonight, who is joining us tonight, and who especially knows this person, I am very much privileged and grateful to have him here tonight with us. So without further ado, let us all welcome our speaker for tonight, Kuya Jem Castor. Hello, Kuya Jem. Hello, Angelica. How are you? I'm, I'm glad to be back again. I'm enjoying quarantine here in my hometown. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. So um, just before you start the message, um, I just have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, sure. just to let our viewers and our participants to get to know you more. Um, so what do you do and where are you currently located? I'm a, I'm a professional tourist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a missionary. I'm an itinerant missionary. I've been going around the world uh, yeah. for the past almost 10 years. Wow. Uh, I've been traveling by faith in God's providence, and it has mm -hmm. been an amazing adventure. So this is the longest right now that I have stayed here in the yeah. Philippines for more than three months already. So it is quite a vacation, but not really a vacation. <laughs> Still a good break, I guess. It is. It is. Yeah. And uh, as you've said, that you're a missionary, and I'm pretty sure you're used to travel a lot. And um, how are you actually coping with this COVID pandemic at the moment? And how are you keeping your ministry alive? Oh, actually, the ministry right now is even busier compared to the time <laughs> that I was traveling. Like... Uh, <laughs> I'll just give you a little bit of, of a glimpse. Like Saturday, yeah. I spoke five times in three different countries. Wow. So, <laughs> so no, no, no visa needed, no airplane <laughs> ticket needed, and no jet lag. Yes. But I'm, I'm lacking sleep every Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. You're such a very, very busy person. Uh, praise God. <laughs> yeah. And um, last question for you. Um, I know, yes, you've said you're even busier this time, but is there anything else that's keeping you sane at the moment, like in terms of hobbies or interests? Oh, the thing that really is keeping me uh, sane 200, 300% compared to the time that I was busy is the time spent in the Word of God. Wow. I'm so happy right now for this time that I could be alone with Him because during travel during travel, during uh, like uh, uh, successive uh, ministry, sometimes my my time to read and to draw closer to the Lord is not as much as I have it now. So I'm enjoying this uh, this time of peace while I'm having it, and it's not just giving me sanity, but it's giving me so much joy. So praise the Lord for that. Yes, praise the Lord. Amen. And um, yeah, I guess it's really important for ha for us to have um, intimate time with God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And um, yeah, so just before we start, please allow me to pray before um, you speak, Pajam, if that's okay. Sure. I really needed that. Um, it's just our heads. Um, our dear Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you, O oh Lord God, for all that you've done for us, for all the blessings, O oh Lord. And uh, for this opportunity to be here tonight to study your word together and to learn more about you, Lord God, through the characters in the Bible. And Lord God, as we um, listen to the message of Kujem, um, may you be with him, anoint his lips, and uh, may everyone who's listening be blessed with the message and be inspired, Lord God, to follow you and um, uh, prioritize you in our lives. Lord God, we... Um, Lift this time up to you and please be with all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Angelica. And thank you everyone for joining us. I know that you have been blessed. You have been blessed for the past two nights. So uh, 
I praise God that uh, He has been pouring out His Spirit upon us. And uh, I know this is quite a struggle for us speakers to speak via Zoom because I know most of the speakers are very, very much interactive. And, uh, and I could not somehow shake your hands. I could not hug you. And sometimes I could not even see your reactions because your videos are off. So if you could switch on your videos, that would really, really help uh, a very animated speaker like me. <laughs> so, and I know you can respond as well. You could not say amen because your mics are requested to be mute. So if you agree with the talk, if you want to say amen, just lift up both of your fingers. Can we do that? Okay, yes, praise God. And for those of you who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, this is a good thing about Zoom. Or, uh, or virtual uh, was this or virtual conference because we could shout our lou loudest amen and no one will be bothered maybe except your neighbors or the person who's seated beside you but uh, do not hold back whatever it is that the Lord has placed in your heart if you agree with a message or with a point just lift up your fingers or say the word amen so this evening friends as uh, as we have seen in the in the title it's about the disciples. It's about their ambitious heart. It's a little giveaway because this is one thing that, that really struck me. I was listening to, to the sermon of, of Alistair Hong one time, and I was listening to it while, uh, while painting my ceiling. So I guess, I guess you could see, yes, that great thing. Yeah, I was painting it, and I don't want, I don't want to waste uh, time. Now, I know that I'll, while I'm painting, I'm being useful, but I want to fill my mind with something else. And that's a hint for you guys. If you are doing something like, uh, like ordinary, you could, you could fill in that gap. You could fill in the time by listening to beautiful music or listening to a beautiful sermon. And this sermon is entitled, actually, Blessings in the Storm. I was intrigued because during the time that I was painting this, the coronavirus is just like really really going crazy so while i was listening to that friends it somehow brought me to to the story that alistair was was talking about it was about the disciples during the time that they faced one of the scariest storms in their life the physical storm in the boat remember that that story guys did you remember that okay so that's that's the story and i want to know more about that story so praise god that he gave that he gave me the he gave us the the reference and it's found in desire of ages a night in the lake that was that was a title of uh, of the story and of course we're talking about the disciples we're talking about Jesus and this is quite strange friends because when you look at it the disciples who have been living so close with Jesus the disciples who have been following Jesus wherever he went the disciples who have been eating on the same table most of the meals where Jesus ate, maybe sleeping in the same room where Jesus slept. Some of the disciples have a misconception of the mission of Jesus. And that is the topic of, that we have tonight. How can these disciples somehow have a misconception with the mission of, of the teacher who had been teaching the people <laughs> and they have been hanging out with this teacher and somehow what in the world that they missed out? <laughs> and so, and I guess it's a giveaway already because you have seen the title. <laughs> so you have seen the title. But before we, we go on, let us bow our heads once again with a short word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, once again, we come before you and we praise and we thank you, dear Father, that we could never pray enough. We praise and we thank you, Lord, for, for this fellowship. And I thank you, Lord, for the prayer of my sister Angelica a while ago. Lord, I pray, I, I feel my incapacity to, to bring this message, my inability, O oh Lord, to speak your words, not unless you fill me with your spirit. So, Lord, I ask in a very special way that may you please speak your words. May you hide me behind the shadow of your cross. May not be seen nor be heard, but Jesus and Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be lifted up and exalted. Father, we ask this in the loving name of your son, Jesus, all your children say, amen. So the story goes like this. Remember, this is the time when the 5,000 were fed. It's a Sermon on the Mount. And after the Sermon on the Mount, there was, there was this group of people who were hungry. And so they were fed. And remember, 
They were fed through what? Five loaves of bread and two fish. And the people were just so amazed. They were blown away. Wow, such a miracle that happened today. And they have seen Jesus perform miracles, friends. Just imagine, he had been healing the sick. Now, he has been multiplying food. And they're thinking, man, if this man will be our king, just imagine, if this, if this man will be our king, just imagine if they go to war, every wounded soldier will be raised back to life. Or every dead soldier will be raised back to life. And he could feed the whole nation and there would be no problem. And the whole crowd was wanting to crown him as king. And the disciples joined in. And they were so excited, friends. They were so excited. This, they're thinking, this is the fulfillment of our dreams. Our master, our rabbi, is now going to be crowned as king. And this is one thing, friends. This is one thing. This is where the disconnect happened here. They were following Jesus because they were imagining that the Messiah would be a literal earthly king. But that was not what Jesus was trying to somehow convey to people. He was not here to be a king of Israel. He was here to be the king of our hearts. He was here to free people, not just from the slavery or for the bondage of human nation, of, of, of the Roman Empire but he was here to free them from sin. And that is where the disconnect that happened. And, and friends, just imagine, while they were somehow moving forward to, to corner Jesus and to crown him king, and Jesus somehow dispersed them. He told, Jesus told him, go home. And friends, in the manner that Jesus, that Jesus spoke, listen to this, they recognized in him a power above all earthly authority and without a question, they submit. For the first time, maybe for the first time, for, for most of the disciples, they saw Jesus somehow gave his authority. And by the way, Jesus did not yell. Jesus, in a very calm, loud but calm voice, told them, stop, go home. And he commanded the disciples to go to the boat and start rowing. And he will met, meet them on the other side of the lake. And this is the, the situation, friends. The disciples, they followed afterwards. They were still waiting upon Jesus when they went to the, to the boat. And by the way, friends, this passage is found in Matthew 14, 22 to 27. If you want to read this later. And John 6, 16 to 21. But friends, if you want to have a, a, a bigger picture of this, I suggest that you read this chapter, A Night in the Lake, in the Zara of Ages, I guess it's in uh, chapter 39, but uh, you could start by looking at uh, page 378, paragraph four. So that's where I'm jumping up from. So what happened, friends? Let's move on. While the disciples were in the boat, you know what was happening? They were complaining. They were saying, oh, man, and they were more impatient. This is the description. They had left Jesus with dissatisfied hearts more impatient with him than ever before since acknowledging him as their Lord. They murmured because they had, they had not been permitted to crown him king. And they said, if we would have been more persistent, we could have had him crowned king by now. So they were blaming themselves. Oh, we should have been more persistent. And friends, they did not realize that unbelief was taking possession of their hearts and their minds. And listen to this. The love of honor blinded them. Did you get this, friends? So now you might have a picture why the title is Ambitious Hearts of the Disciples. The love of honor somehow blinded them. And friends, who among us here don't want honor? I guess almost all of us, friends, somehow we want to be recognized. Oh, especially for the sanguines, friends. Sanguines loves the spotlight. <laughs> But some of us who might not be like as vocal as out there as a sanguines, we, we love even, even silently. We love to be recognized. And honor, we love that. We desire for that. And, and here, it's Fred. Listen to this. This is some of their complaints. Why did he not, why not he who possessed such power reveal himself in his true character and make their way less painful? So friends, they begin to, to complain about their situation. 
they began to complain about their state. And remember, friends, the Pharisees, the high priests are somehow condemning them, telling, telling the people that Jesus is a false prophet. Listen, friends. Thus the disciples reasoned until they brought upon themselves great spiritual darkness. And they even complained, why did he not save John the Baptist? And all this negativity they entertained. They questioned, could Jesus be an imposter? As the Pharisees asserted, wow, did you get this, friends? A few minutes ago, a few hours ago, a couple of hours ago, they were ready to crown him king. A couple of hours ago, they have witnessed one of the greatest manifestations of God's power. And now they were questioning, could he be the imposter that the Pharisees are telling us about? It's crazy, isn't it? And this is one thing, friends. This is my takeaway here. If when we do not yield to the will of the Father, it will hinder us from knowing Christ's mission. Did you get this? Friends, if we refuse to yield to the will of the Father, we will somehow miss out on our mission, which will bring about the satisfaction of our present situation that will eventually lead us to question the reality of God. Did you get this, friends? And this is the reason why that submission is very important. Surrender is very important because if we do not do so, then it's, it's difficult, it's impossible for us to know what God's perfect will for us is, to know what God mis God's mission for us is. And in that, uh, in that message of Alistair Hong, he pointed out three things, three factors that somehow, somehow block the disciples from seeing the real mission of Jesus Christ. There are three Ps. How many Ps? How many reasons? Three, okay. I saw some people answering. Maybe some of you are already sleeping away. <laughs> okay, so three reasons, friends. Three reasons why the disciples have not seen the true mission of Jesus Christ. The first one is the prospect of prosperity. Did you get this, friends? The prospect of prosperity. Yes, the ambition to get rich. Yes, friends, the ambition to get rich. And this is one thing, this is one thing I realize. These are the things that blocks our vision from seeing Christ's true mission in our lives as well. Because we thought that the Lord put us here in this world, in Philippines or in Sydney, to be rich. My dear friends, no. That is not your real mission. Even though riches is very attractive, but that is not your real mission. Do not get distracted. And the second one is that, Political power. Yes, friends. I know that pol politics is not just happening outside, uh, uh, just not happening in the government. It happens in, it happens in a household. It happens in a church. Yes, even in household politics are happening. Friends, I'm the sixth among the six siblings. Yes, I'm, I'm the youngest. And I experience politics inside the house. Like when my mom, before when, when she was alive, when she was, when she was uh, uh, commanding my, my brother, my eldest brother to do something, my, my eldest brother will pass it to the second. And the second will pass it to the third. The third will pass it to the fourth. Fourth and so on. And the fifth will pass it to me. And I don't have anyone to pass it on to. I looked around. It's just the dogs and me. So friends, that's, that's politics. And this is one thing I realized. It's happening also in the church. Yes, friends, and during the time, it's happening so much in the church. And this is something somehow that, that blocks our visions from, from seeing Christ's mission because sometimes we are thinking that if I had this position, the work would progress in no time. If I had this influence, I would do much more for the glory of God. My dear friends, it's not. The proof of the matter is that look at Jesus, friends. He holds no position. He was even blacklisted. <laughs> He's not even holding a position in the church. But get this. This man, our Savior, changed the whole course of the earth. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> amen. Friends, you should be more enthusiastic than that. Amen. 
<laughs> Amen. Yes. Okay. I praise God that I'm talking to a live audience right now. So praise the Lord. So the first one is what? The first one is the prospect of prosperity, the ambition to get rich. The second one is the political power, ambition to have the power. And the third one is popular opinion. Yes, friends, we want to be right. We want to somehow please the people around us. We want to, we want to get the, uh, what do you call this? Yes, popular opinion. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> and these are the things that somehow blocks the vision of the disciples from seeing Christ's mission. So is the ambition to be rich, to be powerful, and to be popular. Those are the things that somehow blocking the eyes of the disciples. And friends, when Jesus left them, when Jesus told them to go and, and go row in the boat, remember where did Jesus go? He went to a solitary place and prayed. And this is one thing, friends. You know what was Jesus praying for? He was not praying for himself. He was praying for them. He was praying for them. And get this. The manner of Jesus' prayer really blew my mind. Listen to this, friends. Jesus went up into a mountain apart to pray for hours. He continued pleading with God. For what? Hours. He did not say for, for a few minutes, for a few seconds. He stayed out here for hours. He continued pleading with God. Not for himself, but he was pleading for the disciples. And listen to this. He prayed for power to reveal to men the divine character of his mission, that Satan might not blind their understanding and pervert the judgment. And this is one thing that hit me, friends. Whenever, whenever we don't see the real mission that Christ has for us, you know what Jesus does? He intercedes for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for me, that we may be able to see the real mission that Christ has for us. And you might wonder, why do we really need to know his mission for us? Why could Jesus just leave us alone and enjoy how we live our lives? Friends, I promise there is, there is a reason for that later. If I forget, friends, remind me. <laughs> remind me. I tend to forget. I'm growing old, friends. So listen to this. This is what he was praying for. And you know why he was praying for Jesus was really wanting the disciples' heart to be prepared. He doesn't want them to, to be devastated with the reality that's about to hit them. Because they're wanting for Jesus, friends. Remember, they're wanting for Jesus to be king. But in reality, Jesus had been telling them that he will be crucified, that he will, that he will die. But they were not listening. It's because of their personal ambitions. And friends, Jesus was preparing them for his crucifixion. And, and Jesus knew that if they don't get the mission right now, they will be disappointed. Their hearts would really be broken. And listen, friends, in travail of conflict of soul, he prayed for his disciples. They were to be grievously tried. Their long-cherished hope based on a popular delusion were to be disappointed in most painful and humiliating manner. And this is one thing that really struck me. In the place of his exaltation to the throne of David, they were to witness his crucifixion. And his crucifixion, this was to be indeed his true coronation. Wow. His crucifixion will be indeed his true coronation. And listen to this. It was painful to Jesus that their conceptions of his kingdom were so great to a degree limited to worldly aggrandizement and honor. For them, for the disciples, the burden was heavy upon his heart, and he poured out his supplications with bitter agony and tears. Friends, isn't that crazy? That Jesus was interceding for his disciples with bitter agony and tears because they don't get to see the reality of his mission. And I could picture this whenever you, me, and us as a church somehow fail to see Christ's true mission for us. Christ is in agony, in tears, interceding, that you may be able to see the clarity of the mission that he has for you. 
listen, friends, and and remember, the day was perfect. They had they had witnessed something really powerful, as I told you a while ago. And listen to this, friends. Had they had they out of the abundance of their hearts been conversing together in regard to the things that they have witnessed for that day, they would not have entered into temptation. Do you get this, friends? There are a lot of things to talk about, especially the bad things that are happening right now. Especially this, what the effects of the pandemics to you, to me. There are a lot of negative things that we could talk about, but get this. I believe there are a lot of blessings that we could focus our minds into as well. Can you say amen? Amen. Yes. I, I love that you're more enthusiastic this time. Yes. This is one thing I realized, friends. There might be a lot of problems that are hitting you right now. Like, like you have not hit the way that you have hit before. And maybe you have fell flat on your face a couple of times, maybe multiple times. But get this. Just look at, look at in, this, in this past just month and see how many, how many ways the Lord proved to you that he has been good to you. There had been a lot of times, and this is one thing, friends, that will keep us from a downward spiral depression of negativity because the moment we dwell upon all those negative things, the enemy is happy. He just keeps on throwing firewood into the campfire of negativity. Do not let him throw another, another wood. Yes, friends, take out all the wood, throw it farther. The moment you focus on the good things that God has done, my dear friends, his campfire will never burn. So <clears throat> listen to this. Their thoughts were stormy and unreasonable, and the Lord gave them something else to afflict their souls and occupy their minds. Listen, friends, God often does this when men create burdens and troubles for themselves. <laughs> if you want to talk more problem, the Lord will allow you to do so. <laughs> That you may go to a point that you will experience what the disciples have experienced. Listen, friends, listen. A violent tempest had been stealing upon them and they were unprepared for it. Friends, it was a sudden contrast, remember? It was a beautiful day. They were sitting on, on the fields. They were sitting on the mountain listening to Jesus. There was not a single drop of rain. And now in the middle, in the middle of this lake, now a tempest was about to hit them. And while while they are in the middle of the storm, listen to this, friends. They forgot their disaffection, their unbelief, and their impatience. <laughs> friends, sometimes a storm is needed. Huh? Can you say amen? <laughs> sometimes the storm is needed to wash all those negativity away. And this is my takeaway here, friends. A storm is needed to shake us out of a wrong course that we may see where God desires to lead us. Sometimes we're headed towards the wrong direction. That's why the Lord has to send to us the storm that he may reroute our path. Remember Jonah? Friends, remember Jonah. <laughs> the Lord sent a storm. And that's, oh, that's the storm I don't want to face, friends. Got swallowed by a big fish. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a scary one. So listen, friends, everyone worked to keep the boat from sinking. Everyone worked. So because of the storm, their attention was focused from, was diverted, I mean, from their complaints, from their murmurings, from their dissatisfaction, from the malice in their hearts. And now the storm was somehow the reason for them to unite, <laughs> to come together. And to somehow paddle for their lives, row for their lives. And listen to this. And, and you know the situation that they're facing. They were, they were going through this storm, not in a, in a few minutes, friends. Listen to this. Until the fourth watch of the night, they toiled at the oars. Then the weary men gave themselves up for loss. My dear friends, you know, English is not my first language. And the fourth watch of the night, what is that? So somehow I, I looked it up. And fourth watch of the night, actually, the night is just divided into three watches. 
This is from the Bible commentary. I sound look like I sound I sound like a a Bible scholar right now, but uh, I'm not a scholar. <laughs> Friends, the three parts of the nights and the first watch, I guess the early watch, the sunset to to somewhere, and then the middle watch it covers the midnight, and the third watch covers from 3 a.m. to like 6 6 a.m. and the fourth watch. What is the fourth watch? I think this is the term that they give. It's like almost the breaking of dawn. Friends, just imagine. Just imagine what time did they leave? They leave the place. When Jesus asked them to leave, it was, I guess, sunset. And sunset, I don't know if it was summer or... Friends, they estimated they were at least six hours rowing for their lives. It is crazy. I don't know if I could I could manage six minutes rowing in the t- in the storm. I will pass out. I will I will die, friends. But these people were rowing for six hours. So imagine, imagine you were there. I don't know if some of you have watched the perfect storm. I have not watched that. I just saw I just saw the uh, what's this? I just saw the the poster, friends. That poster is so scary. The waves are big. And this, I guess I could, I could picture out. This is similar, the, the situation. Oops. Okay. But it says here, friends, it says here, oh, in the storm and darkness, the sea had taught them their helplessness and they longed for the presence of their master. Woo! Did you get this? Let me read that again. If you did not get it, maybe it's because of my English. Listen. In the storm and in the darkness, the sea had taught them their own helplessness and they longed for the presence of their master. Friends, how many of us cried out, help, Lord, in this time of pandemic, in this time of storm? I guess a lot of us. And I believe even the atheists were crying out. Yes, friends. You check out their membership, it reduced. A lot of atheists were calling out in the name of God. And this is sometimes what we need. We need a storm. We need the darkness of the storm to somehow call us out of our confidence in our strength, in our economy, and somehow helps us to see that, friends, we are going nowhere without God. We don't have any solution if we do not have God with us. And wow, just looking at just looking at the, the news right now. I I read in Facebook, yes. I get my news on Facebook. It's sad, isn't it? I don't want to watch the news. So if I if I saw some of my friends pass me some news, that's that's my news, friends. I'm not I'm not a newspaper reader or something, but I saw in in Facebook the CEO of uh, of Airbnb. He said that, wow, in the 12 years that they were trying to build this business, in just a matter of six weeks, coronavirus destroyed it. It's crazy, friends, isn't it? A lot of businesses are closing down right now. America, there are like 40 million people declared unemployment. Isn't that crazy? We are living in times of uncertainty. A lot of people right now are really calling out in the name of God. So, friends, this storm somehow reminds us that we don't have any future here. Yes, friends. Even though we have a very, very good course or career, friends, our future is not here. Our future is up there. Can you say amen? Amen? Yeah. Amen, my dear friends. Our future, our most stable future is up there. So let us move on. This is now the exciting times. Listen to this. Listen. Jesus had not forgotten them. Can you say amen to that again? Jesus had not what? Had not forgotten them. The watcher on the shore saw those fear-stricken men battling with the tempest. And listen to this. Listen to this. Not for a moment did he lose sight of his disciples. Whoa. Did you hear that? Not for a moment did he lose sight of his disciples. 
this is one thing I want to pass to you as well. In the storms that you're facing, in the questions that, that somehow boggles your mind right now, in the things that have scared you, and the things that you thought that will end your life, that will end your career, not for a moment did he lose his sight on you. Can you say amen to that, friends? Amen. Amen. With deepest solicitude, his eyes followed the storm-tossed boat with its precious burden. For this man were to be the light of the world. And you are as precious as those disciples is to Jesus. And you are to be the light of Sydney, of Australia, friends. When their hearts were subdued, their unholy ambitions quelled, and in humility they prayed for help, it was given them. Listen, friends, at the moment when they believe themselves lost, a gleam of light reveals a mysterious figure approaching them upon the water. But they know not that it was Jesus, the only one who has come to their help. They count as an enemy. Isn't this crazy? <laughs> Jesus was coming towards them. They were somehow calling on the name of Jesus. And now Jesus comes and they thought Jesus was the enemy. <laughs> Isn't this crazy? Listen, friends. Terror overpowers them. The hands that have grasped the oars with muscles like iron let go their hold. The boat rocks the will of the waves at will at the will of the waves. All eyes are riveted on the vision of a man walking upon the white cap billows of the foaming sea. Friends, isn't this a crazy situation? They have been rowing for like nearly eight hours. And now a ghost? is coming to kill them. Just imagine, can you empathize right now with the situation of these scared disciples in the middle of the storm? And listen to this. They think it a phantom that omens their destruction and they cried out for fear. <laughs> they thought Jesus was a ghost. Isn't that crazy? It's funny because we, we know the story, but imagine you are there on the boat, your eyes, your face was somehow washed with salt water for the, for the last eight hours. And now this mysterious figure came. And listen to this. Jesus advances as if he would pass them. Did you get this? This is quite crazy. Jesus advances as if he would pass them. I'll give you a picture. Let me, let me do this. Jesus, Jesus was walking and all of a sudden, he was about to turn. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? He was about to turn. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus came as near as possible that they will, they will be able to recognize that it was him. Why didn't Jesus just like walk straight away to the boat and join them? You know why? Because we need to call on his name. We need to invite him in. Can you say amen to that, friends? We need to invite him. We need to call. You need to call on his name. And this is the thing. If Jesus gives you the solution, if you have not called on his name, when the solution comes, who will you give the credit to the solution to? <laughs> That's why you need to call upon him. That you will know when the solution comes. It only came from the one who has heard your prayers, and that is him. And friends, listen to this. When they called on the name of Jesus, but when they recognized him and cried out, entreating his help, their beloved master turns. His voice silenced their fears. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Isn't it an amazing ending? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And all he did was... Peace be still. And the storm stood still. This is one thing, friends. And I was somehow reading this story. Why did Jesus have to let them go through that storm? It's, the answer is obvious. Because they somehow missed out on the real mission that Jesus has for them. And Jesus has to wash away all their, all their unbelief, all the malice, all the envy, all 
dis, their dissatisfied hearts, all their misconceptions. But then something that hit me, something really hard that hit me. Jesus was wanting them to know the real mission, the reason why Jesus washed them by bringing, through, bringing them through that storm because Jesus wants them to be prepared in the biggest storms that each of them will face. Did you get this, friends? Jesus was preparing them for the biggest storms that we'll be facing as they carry on the mission that Jesus has given them. And friends, I was trying to research how these disciples were killed. Listen to this. You know how, how Judas killed was, was killed. He took his own life. But look at the rest of the disciples. Bartholomew, he was skinned alive and beheaded. James, James the less, I think this is a James, the brother of Jesus. This is not James, the brother of John. He was stoned and clubbed to death. Andrew, he was crucified, tied upside down in an X-shaped cross from where he preached for two days before he finally died. Peter, he was crucified at his request, upside down. Thomas was impaled by a spear. James the Great, this is the brother of John, he was beheaded. Philip, he was thrown to prison, scourged, and finally crucified. Matthew, he was nailed to a bed, covered his whole body with paper, brimstone, oil, asphalt, and brushwood, and set him on fire. Thaddeus has two versions of his death. He was crucified or, or clubbed to death. And Simon as well was crucified or axed to death. And John, John the Beloved, was thrown in boiling oil that survived. And he died in his old age. And this is one thing, friends, that I realize. That the Lord wants them to get their mission. To understand his mission for them. That they will be prepared. They will not be moved when the biggest storms of their lives is going to hit them. And this is one thing that happened as well. As you could see the duplication of these of this experiences of the martyrs. Of those people who were placed in the Colosseum. When the lions were released, they were there in the middle singing. Nothing could move them out of their, of their faith in God. Why? Because they have seen, they have understood the real mission that God has for them. Those, those martyrs who were burned at the stake and they were dressing up while they were marching as if they were going to a wedding. Friends, this is what happens when we get to see the real mission. Mission of Christ in its truest form. Not obliterated. Not blocked by our own personal ambitions. We will be strengthened to face the storm that we will face in the end. And this is one thing, friends. One thing that I realize. One thing I realize that we will be facing a storm soon that's going to be bigger than the storm that we're facing right now. It will be a storm that would be more brutal, that would be more overwhelming than the storm of pandemic. And God desires to give us the strength to face through that, that we will stand in the midst of the storm unmoved, like Peter, like, like Paul in Acts 20 verse 24 when he declared, none of these things move me. So I hope and I pray, my dear friends, that this study that we have this evening will bring each and every one of us to the point of desperation to get to know what Christ's mission for me is, what Christ's mission for you is. Because the moment you get to see that, my dear friends, it is way better than your own personal ambitions. Because your own personal ambitions, the fulfillment of that, will not give you really fulfillment at all. Will not give you contentment. 
This is only one place that it is found. It's found in the presence of your Lord. And that's where this mission is found as well. Let us bow our heads for the prayer. Let us pray. Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you. We praise you, dear Father, for giving us this lesson that we could learn from, from the disciples. We could learn from, from Jesus. Lord, we praise and we thank you that your desire for us is that we'll be desperate for you. Because we know that you cannot wait to bestow upon us your blessings that are way better than all these this distractions that distracts us. And you want to give us the strength to get us through the storm. So Lord, I pray in a very special way that you please anoint each and every person here who is in the Zoom meeting. And for brothers and our sisters or friends who are watching on Facebook, on YouTube, dear Lord, I pray in a very special way right now that you please speak to us. Help us, Lord, to give our hearts to you. And whatever it is, dear Father, that's blocking us from seeing the mission that you have placed for us, Dear Lord, I pray that you please remove it. Take it away, O oh Lord. We are too weak to, to give it. So Lord, just please take it away from our hands. Give us a heart that would be willing to yield, who would be willing to surrender them to you. And our prayer tonight, Lord, is please take our hearts for we cannot give it. Please keep it pure for we cannot keep it for thee. Please save us in spite of ourselves, our weak and Christ-like selves. And mold us and fashion us and lift us to the pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through our soul. Lord, we praise and we thank you that from now on, our heart, our hearts, our lives are your property. It is yours to begin with, O oh Lord. So thank you so much. And we thank you, Lord, that whatever storms that we'll face, we will never be moved because you will be with us in the midst of that storm. We love you, O oh Lord. Please open our eyes and help us to see the things that will clear up all those misconceptions that we have, that we may fall in love with Jesus over and over again. We ask this. We ask for the anointing of your Holy Spirit in the loving name of your son, Jesus, all your children say, amen. Amen. So again, good evening, everyone. Or good night, and I hope and I pray that you will have a peaceful night, even in the midst of the storm. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Kuya Jem, for the message that you just shared. I'm pretty sure everyone was able to relate and reflect on our own lives and our relationship with God. And I've just realized how important it is to focus on Jesus and not on what's happening around, especially the COVID-19 pandemic right now. And um, I would just like to ask if anyone has any questions for Gem, please uh, type it on the chat box right now. Otherwise, um, we will end this meeting soon. <laughs> Anything from YouTube or Facebook? Angelica will answer it. <laughs> Okay, I guess there are no questions and the message was very clear. So thank you so much once again, Kajem. And um, thank you also for our um, viewers and our participants who joined us tonight. And uh, please don't forget to tune in again tomorrow night for our fourth night of our devotional week. And um, we will be having our very own Stanley Rinaldi who will be talking about David facing your giants. So see you Thanks once God. again tomorrow. Have a good night and stay safe, everyone. Signing Bye. off. <laughs>